It's time. You guys requested it, the top 10 supervillains that became heroes. For this first outing, let's look at a group who stayed good, or are hopefully going to. No flip floppers, unless they now flop back to the side of good. I'm Sasha Wood, and let's get started. Number 10. Clayface, a character for whom the first question has to be, which one? We're talking about Basil Carlo, the first Clayface, who first appeared in Detective Comics number 40. There are nine Clayfaces for the record, more if you count some smaller story arcs. Basil Carlo was initially an actor who went insane after hearing there was a remake of a classic horror film he had starred in without him. Thusly, he dons the mask of Clayface, a villain he once played, and begins killing the actors. He eventually gains the ability to shapeshift at a much later point by injecting himself with blood samples from Preston Payne, Matt Hagen, and Sandra Fuller, three of the other Clayfaces. This gives him the more traditionally recognized Clayface abilities and character design. However, like all characters, Carlo has changed over time. His most recent appearance in Rebirth has painted him in a more sympathetic light, saddened over becoming a monster. In Detective Comics number 934, released in 2016, Carlo is recruited to join the new team of Gotham heroes that Batman is setting up, an offer which Carlo accepts. How long will this new and improved Clayface last? Only time will tell, which is what makes him number 10. We have to wait and see. Someone else whose past haunts them in at number 9, Black Widow. Natasha Romanova, also known as Natasha Romanoff, first appeared in Tales of Suspense number 52 back in 1964. She first appeared as an antagonist for Iron Man. Her history has her hailing from Russia, first starting out as an eager Soviet spy and later retconned to her more recognized origin. That of her being raised by the Black Ops program, specifically Department X for Orphan Girls, where she is brainwashed washed and trained in the Red Room, as well as enhanced with both psycho and biotech. It takes her years to break free of her psychological trauma, which she does with the help of Hawkeye, and manages to defect, becoming a double agent. Her villainous past is well known, and has been used as a narrative element for many of her stories. Someone she actually aided on his path to villainy in at number 8, it's Hawkeye. The first Hawkeye, Clint Barton. He appeared in Tales of Suspense number 57, released in 1964. Hawkeye is introduced as being jealous of all the attention afforded to Iron Man after he saves some bystanders from a loose pinwheel at Coney Island where Hawkeye works as a marksman, and a pretty underappreciated one. Hawkeye quickly makes his own costume and takes to the streets, but in stopping a thief from robbing a jewelry store, he gets mistaken for said thief, and thus his criminal career is born. He is shortly after recruited by the Black Widow, who he is quite taken with, and is manipulated into going after Iron Man. Hawkeye wasn't a villain for long, in fact he joined the Avengers in Avengers Vol. Volume 1, number 16, in 1965. Still, his genesis and reasoning for putting on the costume is pretty funny. Jealousy is not the most heroic of motivations. These showboatsman-like elements to his personality still emerge from time to time, and it's always a treat when they do. Every superhero team needs a jerk. They also need a suave ladies man, and we have one in at number 7. It's Gambit. Remy LeBeau from the X-Men makes his first full non-cameo appearance in Uncanny X-Men Volume 1, number 266 in 1990. Though there is some debate about that, but we'd be here all day. Nitpicking. Gambit was kidnapped as a baby and raised by the LeBeau clan thieves guild, and ultimately ended up being adopted by the guild's patriarch. A lot happened in between, including a brief stint being captured by a child slave trader, but he ends up being hired by Mr. Sinister. This leads to his involvement in some key moments, such as witnessing Wolverine's escape from Weapon X, and finding and burning Nathaniel Essex's diaries. Eventually expelled from the thieves guild, he ends up working full time for Mr. Sinister, who modifies his powers and has him take part in a significant massacre of the more Warlocks. However, Gambit's conscience begins to chafe at him, and he eventually leaves to wander the world and become a master thief. Oh, I'm so guilty. I must steal. Upon his travels, he encounters a de-aged Storm and saves her from the Shadow King, and is led back to the X-Men. Gambit's transformation to hero is slow, and his past is full of questionable actions that make not only his teammates question him, but him question himself. Gambit doesn't always feel at home with the X-Men, but has come to be a key part of the superhero community, whether he is with them or not. Someone people often think of when they think of Gambit in number 6, Rogue. Rogue's first published appearance was in Avengers Annual number 10 in 1981. 
one, although her full background was not given until years later, which has ultimately led to some conflict with previously released backstories. Regardless, here's what has remained true. Rogue has had a difficult childhood, particularly after her powers manifest, culminating in her being traumatized after she accidentally puts the boy she has a crush on in a coma. Taken in by Mystique prior to this incident, her anger and bitterness make her an easy target and she is recruited into the Brotherhood of Mutants. Rogue quickly becomes part of the group's terrorist activities, and during an attempted prison escape, she uses her powers to absorb Miss Marvels. However, due to the prolonged amount of contact required, she also absorbs her psyche, and the transfer of powers becomes permanent. This is actually the reason that Rogue can fly. However, when Rogue later tries to absorb Rom the Space Knight, she experiences his feelings of nobility and sacrifice that begin to change her as a person. As Rogue uses her powers and absorbs more and more psyches, the more hers becomes damaged. Eventually, with nowhere else to turn, Rogue seeks out Professor Xavier and the X-Men for help. Professor Xavier invites her to stay and become one of the X-Men. Rogue has come a long way, finding confidence in herself and forgiving herself for her past actions. She is now a powerful force for good, and most likely always would have been had she had better influences in her youth. She has become an iconic character, as has her relationship with fellow reformed villain Gambit. Also Magneto. But we don't have time for that. More complex backstory in at number 5. Emma Frost. Emma initially appeared as a villain, the White Queen of the Hellfire Club. Her first appearance was during the iconic storyline The Dark Phoenix Saga, issues 129 to 138 of the Uncanny X-Men that ran in 1980. She was part of the plot that attempts to take control of Jean Grey's mind and turn her to the club's own devices, which backfires spectacularly. Her signature design was inspired by Emma Peel from the 1960s Avengers series, specifically the outfit worn by Diana Rigg in the episode Queen of Sin. Years later, following the devastating attack on the mutant island of Genosha, Emma Frost is rescued by the X-Men and ultimately joins. This culminates not only her switching allegiances and becoming a key member of the team, but in starting a romantic relationship with Cyclops that has become one of Marvel's most enduring couples. At this point, they've probably actually been together longer than him and Jean. Number 4. The Pied Piper, Hartley Rathaway from The Flash The Pied Piper first appeared in The Flash number 106 back in 1959. Born deaf, Rathaway was able to hear after receiving implants, and his first origin from his father, later from Dr. Will Magnus. Either way, he became obsessed with sound and began experimenting, which granted him the ability to hypnotize and later on create sonic weapons. Because he's also a genius, like a disproportionate amount of people in any superhero universe are. The Pied Piper was a villain of the second Flash, Barry Allen, but retired after his death and went on to become a champion for the underprivileged. He also became one of DC's first openly gay characters and became a good friend to the third Flash, Wally West. While while Hartley has had his relapses, he remains pretty firmly on the side of good. Someone who doesn't seem to relapse though people keep waiting for it at number 3. Plastic Man, Patrick Eel O'Brien from Quality Comics. Later, the rights to his character were purchased by DC. He made his first appearance in Police Comics number one. Orphaned at age 10, Patrick has to live on the streets off his wits. He becomes a burglar specializing in safe cracking. However, one night during an escape, he was shot and fell into a vat of chemicals. And we all know what that means. Fantastic powers. <laughs> Not certain death. This gave him the ability to mold and stretch himself into any shape. So maybe Rubber Man would be more apt. Or Elastic Man, which wasn't taken at the time as a name, but oh well, doesn't matter, he became Plastic Man. However, it's gaining these powers that makes Plastic Man give up on his life of crime, as he is determined to use these powers for good, starting by crafting the most ridiculous costume he could think of. He is a more comedic based superhero and frequently the butt of jokes, and also some small degree of skepticism given his past, but he has good intentions and his powers are incredibly useful. Think Mr. Fantastic if he wasn't a jerk. Someone trying hard to be a jerk and failing in at Number 2. Megamind. Released in 2010, this film focused on the titular Megamind, who arrives on Earth at the same time as his rival, Metro Man. While Metro Man lands in a mansion, Megamind lands in a prison. Seeking to fit in but never quite achieving it thanks to his accident prone nature and Metro Man's penchant for showing off, Megamind decides that if he can't be a hero, he'll be a villain. However, after he seemingly succeeds in taking out Metro Man, he finds a void in his life that can no longer be filled by villainy. This whole film is a fun satire of the superhero genre, particularly of the codependence of the hero-villain relationship. Megamind's slow transformation is a joy to witness and feels genuine. It's just a fun ride meant to encourage viewers that you can rise above what people expect from you, and adjust what you expect from yourself. It's taken me a long time to find my calling. Now it's about time you find yours.
Another permanent convert in at number one, Gru from Despicable Me. Also released in 2010, Gru is once the world's most well known supervillain. It seems he developed a penchant for being bad after an upbringing where many of his talents were neglected. Petty and out to perform the most outlandish of crimes, his status as the greatest supervillain is threatened by a new up and coming rival, Vector. However, a more insidious threat soon emerges fatherhood and the lure of domestic responsibility. Gru finds being a good father much more appealing than being a good supervillain. And he changes his life to better live up to the expectations of his new young family. Lighthearted and sweet, this tale will leave you inspired that you can have it all. Adorable minions, a secret lair, and a happy family. So you may be like, Sasha, this order perplexes and angers me. Well, I wanted to end with people who you can be certain are not going to kill you in your sleep. No risk of relapse with these top three. Unless you're reading some kind of dark AU fanfic, then no one's safe. Which villain would you love to see reform? Let us know down below. I'm Sasha Wood, thanks so much for watching Top 10 Nerd. Like, comment, subscribe, and keep leaving amazing suggestions for even more nerdy lists. See you next time.